to another edition of Blood on the Razor Wire. Today I'm going to bring you a special guest that was with me while I was in USP Big Sandy, one of the most, if not the most dangerous federal prison in the United States at the time that we were there. This man was almost killed and he was there when he was just a youngster, but I'm going to let you, I'm going to introduce you to him and let him tell you his story. Tony, tell the people who you are, where you're from, man, and how old you were when you went into prison. Just give us a little rundown on you. My name is Tony Ellis. I was, I'm from Charlotte, North Carolina. I was uh, 20 when I was indicted, 21 when I went to Big Sandy. I was sentenced to 144 months for uh, cocaine conspiracy and firearms charges. So let me ask you something. Big Sandy was your first prison at 21 years old? First time I'd ever been to prison. I'd never been to state prison or nothing. And you were kind of a little fella when you got there, right? Yeah, man. Um, I've always been small in stature. Um, I was probably 130, 135, 5'8". Five eight. Um, just a yeah, small guy, man. So you ended up in the unit with the ABTs, right? The ABT shot caller was in your unit. That was your first unit over there. First unit, first straight off the bus, they put me in the cell 201 up top, big cell, with a... Um, guy by the name of Russell Olkerson, I think how you pronounce his last name, but his, his uh, Mon Moncure was a uh, hypo, and he was a prospect for the ABT, and he was trying to make his bones with the ABT. So that's Aryan Brotherhood of Texas, right? Yeah. So what happened, man? You ended up having a little incident in that unit. What happened, man? Tell the people about what happened over there. Man, I hit the ground running there, man. I was involved in everything. I was card tables, alcohol, smoking pot. Um, I remember, I never heard about Big Sandy. I never really, nobody in the county jails ever really mentioned Big Sandy. I was under the impression I would definitely go to an FCI. And um, I hit Atlanta, the transfer center, and uh, spoke with the case, case coordinator there. And he was like, yeah, you're designated the USP Big Sandy. And I was like, hold up, USP, why am I doesn't, why? He's like, that's just where you're going. Your points are high. You get so many points for being under the age of 24, 25. And they considered firearms in relation to the drug trafficking crime, a uh, violent charge, even though it really isn't. And um, they just sent me to Big Sandy. And I remember being in one of the holding cells at Atlanta USP. Well, it's not a USP, it's an FCI, but they call it USP. This big biker dude was like, "What's we were, me and him was chopping it up, and uh, he was like, where you going, kid? And I was like, man, they sent me to Big Sandy. And he was like, uh, his eyes got all big and shit, and he was like, man, when you go there, man, you can't go there, man. Just refuse the yard. Refuse the yard. And I'm like, refuse the yard? I didn't understand. I didn't know the lingo. I'm just into the system, basically saying check in. And that really wasn't crossing my mind, man. I was young and dumb, and I was trying to hit the yard, hit the compound, and rip and run. I'm trying to get some alcohol. I'm trying to hit the car table. I'm trying to get my visits, call my people. I'm not going to the hole for nothing. So I hit the unit in Big Sandy, A1, and you got four or five ABT guys in that unit. That was basically their, 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 their strong unit. And what happened? I kicked it off with, with with them, and I was kind of chopping it up and rolling with them, not really in their gang or nothing, but they were the guys in my unit that were involved in the things I like to be involved in, or I was enticed to be involved in, so I was kind of getting comfortable with them, and my celly was one of them. He looked out for me, and his name was Russell. He looked out for me, gave me a radio, gave me some hygiene goods, and the day I got there, I, got, I think I got there on a Thursday. That Friday, we went on lockdown for two weeks. I can't remember what happened. And um, we he taught me how to make wine during that lockdown. It was like a two-week lockdown. And he taught me how to make wine, where we get our bunk metal from to make knives, and the plexiglass you take out of the um, the light fixtures and how you cut it with a sheet. And he, he was just schooling me, man, and um, telling me about his case. And 
how long he got and why he joined, why he wanted to join the Aryan Brotherhood of Texas. And this dude was actually from um South Carolina. So I'm like, Aryan Brotherhood of Texas? Well, how does that work? And I really never understood how that worked, man. He was joining the Aryan Brotherhood of Texas. And I've never been racist. I grew up with black guys, me and my friends. I'm from Charlotte, North Carolina, which is a very diverse city. And um, never really been racist. So I really wasn't partaking in all that racist ideology. And really, they don't really partake in the shit neither. You know, they if, if, the, if a black dude's got some heroin, they buying the heroin from him. Hold on, hold so, on, I hold mean, on. So this is the Aryan Brotherhood of Texas, right? Yeah. And they're buying heroin from the blacks. They don't really care, but they talk this racial stuff, but they're going to run over there and buy that heroin. That's what you're telling the viewers? Yeah, absolutely. And um, they don't really talk about they hate blacks, but if you're Aryan Brotherhood, you're supposed to hate blacks, right? I would assume. I don't know. Not hate blacks, but it's really, it's really a, I don't know. It's weird, man. They're, they're, if the black dudes got weed, if the black dudes got something they want, if the black dudes got books and stamps, they're going to go get it from them. You know, it's not It's not like that. It's not like that. All right. So now your cellies with Russell, but you end up getting in a situation, man, where they almost kill you, right? The ABTs, right? Yeah, with Russell. With Russell. And um, like I said, he was a prospect for the Aryan Brotherhood of Texas. So he's going out of his way to make himself look good for his for his people and so he's doing he's their he's their missile that's what we call him he's their missile if there's something needs to be done they're sending him on it. and he's coming hard dude's probably 190 pounds 500 burpees every day working out he's been in the system he got stabbed at Terra Hut that's why they sent him to USP Big Sandy so dude's dude's pretty 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 solid and um he went to the hole for jumping on that dude in A4 that disrespected Dinky, which was the shot caller for the Aryan Brotherhood. And while he was gone, I continued the winemaking business. He's gone. I'm in the cell. I held the bunk, I held the bottom bunk down for him. I, when he went to the dang shoe, I, I moved my stuff to the bottom bunk. And I'm still making wine, which he had taught me how to do or, or taught me how he had taught me how to make wine. So I'm still making wine, stealing stuff out the child hall buying packs of sweet and low, um, sending people to the store to get the dates and the mellow yellows. And he was gone for maybe five, six weeks or something like that. And we went on lockdowns a couple times and I'm just learning the ropes. I'm hitting the card tables. I'm making the wine. I'm smoking weed. I, I got my knife. You know, everybody's got to have a knife. So you got your knife, you got your plexiglass piece for the yard. You're still piece for the unit. And, um, he come back out the hole, and I was happy to see him out the hole. This was my silly. I I made a relationship with him. You know what I'm saying? I'm like, what's up, man? And he come out. I had a batch of wine coming down that day, and he come in the cell. I moved my shit back up to the top bunk, and uh, we went on lockdown for count and strained the wine, and we started drinking. I was gonna sell the batch, but hell, he just come back. You know, we're gonna drink this. We I, it's a couple gallons. We're gonna drink this. Everybody, all the white boys in the unit gonna get fucked up. Let's drink it. You know, and we drank it. And uh, by the time Count was out, me and him done had a couple couple uh, cups of it. We end up down in Dinky cell drinking wine with Dinky. And uh, big mistake, I ho we was horse playing. Me and Russell started horse playing, which is kind of absurd considering the place that we were at. But we were comfortable. You know, I thought I didn't live with this guy for a couple weeks. We got to know each other. We start horse playing. And somehow I ended up getting him in a chokehold or uh, some type of chokehold, and he couldn't do nothing. So he tapped on my arm. And, and when he tapped, as soon as he tapped on my arm, I let him go. Well, as soon as I let the dude go, he turned around and blasted me, man. Bow! He hit me hard. Very hard. So he hit me, and I can't remember if he knocked me into the wall or onto the, to, to the bunk, and we just start stumping, man. We start fighting. And I'm 130, 135 pounds, so I'm hitting him, but He's hitting me, hitting me. You know what I'm saying? He's he's rocking me. Every hit he's hitting me with is, is really a knockout punch, but I got a hard hit and I ain't never been knocked out. But every hit he's hitting me with is, is ringing my bell. And, um, man, we fought. Dinky, as soon as it popped off, Dinky went outside the door and put his back to the door and left me in the cell with that man. And we fought and fought and fought. And he demolished me in that cell. And then... Coming out, I was drunk, so I can't go and say I remember every word that was spoke. Plus, I was punch drunk. 
But the just the just the situation was he wanted me to leave the unit because the rule is if you put your hands on somebody, they got to get up off the yard because that person could possibly come back and stab you and kill you. you you're not supposed to, you're not supposed to put your hands on somebody and then let them stay. So he wanted me off the off the yard. Check in. You got to go up top. You got to go. Man, I'm not going nowhere. I'm not a rat. I'm not a child molester. I ain't done shit to you. I'm not going nowhere. So we send up, and this was, there was like a five, ten minute span in between. So you're living by the prison code. You're talking about you ain't going nowhere. You're not checking in. You're like, man, I'm a tough guy, man. I'm staying here, right? Well, I was scared, homeboy. I mean, I'm not, I, I, I probably, my general, my adrenaline was pumping and shit, but I probably wasn't scared at the moment. But looking back on the situation, I, I can probably say I was scared, man. You know, these are the, these are the hitters in, for the white race. They're, they're stabbing shit. They're killing shit. But if I walk up out of here, I got, I had the time I had 12 years to do, I probably still had another eight or nine years to do, right? If I walk up out of here, then that ruins my career in the prison system, right? You can't, it, it's go, you're going to go to hold and you're going to go to another compound and then you're going to go back to the hold. And plus, I, I, I'm not walking up out of here, bro. You don't beat the shit out of me. You, you, you know, I'm not walking up out of here. So we start rocking again up in, up in the top cell in this boy named Kelly's cell. He was one of the ones that jumped on Dog, I think. Dog and Justin, uh, uh, what was that kid's name? I interviewed yeah. I interviewed Dog the other day, so yeah. I know who Kelly is. He's one of the ones that was with uh, Josh. Josh Atterbury, I think, was his name, and Kelly. They was both from Alabama. So so uh, we start rocking again, and he smashes me again, of course. And it's a five, I mean, he smashes me for a long time. I mean, I walked around looking like something from Mars for the next two weeks, but we fought a total of three times. He ended up trying to throw me off the top rail. I bit a chunk out his ass, grabbed onto the top top rail and bit a chunk out his ass. And I just, he was trying to kill me, man. He was trying to hurt me bad. And uh, he was like, man, y'all get this kid out of here. And he went he went to go get his knife. And after after I bit him, they broke us up because we, they were trying to get us in the cell to fight, but it spilled out of the cell. And he tried to throw me off the top rail. And kind of flipped me off the top rail and I locked onto it and I bit the shit out of him. And uh, he went to go get his knife. Well, this NLR cat named Richard Harper rolled up. And me and him had chopped it up. He, he was a wine maker and a store man. So we had a little rapport. And he done beat me fighting this cat. And he really didn't like that. Like that Hold area, on. Brother. Well, tell the people what an NLR is, man, so they know. It's a Nazi lowrider. Richard was a really good dude, for real, right? In a prison sense. He was a good dude, man. Richard was a solid dude, man. And what the NLR is, is it's uh, the soldiers for the brand. I think they're on the shit list with the brand, which is the Aryan Brother, the real Aryan Brotherhood of California. They're the so they were the soldiers for the um for the brand. I think they got in the in the bag with the or in the hat with the brand. I, I really don't keep it. I don't know. But he rolled up and after we done fought 15 times or three times and basically saved me from getting stabbed, man. He was like, nah, fuck that. And he took me, he was like, come with me. And he went and politicked it out. He's like, look, y'all not doing nothing to that kid, man. That kid's no fault. Y'all done, done fucked him up for them an hour. We don't watch y'all fuck him up in here for an hour. The kid's not going nowhere. And they went and got my stuff out the cell, out of uh, the cell with uh, Russell and moved me. I can't remember who I moved in with right after, right after that. I think it was a guy named Wolf. But moved me with him. Back and that was it. I hid from the um COs for two weeks. I couldn't go to chow. I was all knotted up and swolled up and ribs were broken and like I was messed up, man. And I hid from them for two, three weeks and healed up and that was it for that situation. Did you have some respect though? Did people respect you after that? Like, man, this little kid's yeah. gonna fight. That's where that's where the name the baby came from. And Richard started calling him like this is the Bubba. He was like my little Bubba. He would just joke with me. And he would they started calling me Richard started calling me the ba the baby. I guess cause I was like the youngest kid in the in the joint, mm, the smallest kid in the joint. Mm. They took me under his wing, man. And he was a solid dude. I remember you. So you were probably about what back then? About five four, five five, and one hundred and thirty nah, pounds. Nah, nah, I was five eight. Five I eight. Was, I, yeah, five eight. I'm still five eight, five nine, five eight and a half. But uh, I was still, man. I was just a young kid, you know. I yeah. remember that. So look, you end up moving out of that unit though, eventually, right? Yeah. Um, 
there was constant tension in that unit between me and these dudes now. And Russell, uh, maybe a week or two after me and him fought like that, um, he ended up going on a mission, which actually started the the beef between the independent car and the ABT because they went up to A4 and uh, jumped on this one cat. I can't remember his name, but jumped on him. And uh, so I stayed in that unit for another month or two. And then that's where I seen my, my the most vicious thing that happened while I, I seen multiple stabbings, but this was like a, one of the most vicious ones, man. And uh, I stayed in that unit for another couple couple weeks. And then my homeboy Coffee was in A1. And you know Coffee. I'm sure we'll talk about that. Um, Coffee was in A1. He was like, man, you got to get away from them dudes. Them dudes got it out for you. Uh, I got an empty cell. We're going to get you over here. And I, and I got over there. I want to talk about that stabbing you just talked about. Tell me about that stabbing. <laughs> so there was this cat named um, Brian Aslock. And he was a... Uh, Brian Ashlock, yeah. And he was a cat from Texas. He was an independent dude from Texas, and he had a gang of time. And um, there was a couple different rumors about why he did it. One, one person said he was a child molester. Another person said he was a rat. But I think it, it came out that he was writing letters to the... Um, I talk about this in my book, where they said he was writing letters, and they could read it on the, on the top of the cardboard. But really, what I think is that the ABT dudes just wanted to steal his shit, right? And I remember I, that, you know, you say it was a vicious stabbing. I wasn't in that unit, but I heard him screaming through the vent. You could actually hear him screaming when they were stabbing yeah. him. And I lived two floors up. Yeah. And, and I it's, remember it's, that stabbing, it, it, man. It was when he stopped screaming that it got more vicious, bro. It was, uh, it was an eye-opener, man. It was an eye-opener to show me where the hell I was at, you know? A lot for a 21-year-old kid to see, right? And the thing is, I was a nervous wreck, man. Um, I had my knife on me. It happened on a Monday. I remember it like yesterday. And the word on the unit was a white boy's going to get it on Monday. Y'all, y'all get your store shit situated. Get your, get your, get your affairs in order because we're going on lockdown. So I'm bugging out, man. I know I got beef with these dudes. I know these dudes don't like me. I know I made them look bad because they didn't get me up off the yard. And I was a nervous wreck. I was. I didn't sleep that, you know, I, anything would wake me up. I had my knife. I knew it was going down Monday morning. They called child. I was up, ready, booted up with my with my knife. I probably was, even even if they were going to come out, I was probably going to get my shit handed to me because, you know, I mean, it was, but I I was nervous. Seeing the, seeing the two hitters come in the unit, they come from B-side, you know, that place you could go anywhere the hell you wanted to go, roll, 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 wherever, wherever you wanted to go. So the cops will and, let you just... The cops will just let you walk into any any unit? Some, Most of them, yeah. You have certain assholes that try to go above and beyond. But for the most part, you come in, as long as you're good by, as long as you're going by count time and you're back where you're supposed to be by count time, you're cool. Okay. So they they came in that Monday morning, man, and... um. You thought they were coming to get you when you heard the rumor. Yeah, <laughs> Hell yeah. Um, I remember they come up the downstairs, and I was like, man, here they come. I'm standing on the top rail with Richard, man. And uh, they come up the damn top, right, top. They come up the stairs right by the door, and I'm like, man, here they come. He's like, just chill, kid. They're not coming for you. He was privy to the information. I wasn't. And uh, and uh, they come up the damn stairs. And I'm like, man, here they come, man. Come on, bro. Come on, bro. I know they're coming for me. He's like, nah, just chill. Just sit back, watch. And we was we was sitting by his cell on the rail, and he was over there on on on, on that run or over there. They come up that rail. Went in there on the man, and he slept in. He broke one of the rules, you know. He he did. He was he was rocking like that, I guess. And uh, he was sleeping in while that door was popped. And it was five thirty, five forty-five in the morning, and they ran in on him and uh, started giving him the business, I guess. And you could see it going on from where we were standing at. You could you couldn't like see. They shut the door behind him, but you could see through the windows the commotion and shit. And then you heard him start screaming. And uh, he screamed for a good minute, two minutes. Then he stopped screaming. And when he stopped screaming, that's when you heard just the object hitting flesh. You know what I'm saying? It's like suction sounds. I know, that's, was, I know that sound, man. I heard it. Man. Yeah. And, you know, it was when he stopped screaming, they still worked on him for 
He had a knife too, though. Didn't, didn't, he, didn't he have a knife? Yeah, he slept one tied to his hand, man. <laughs> that was the other thing. Yep. And he he stabbed one of them though. Didn't he get one of them? Not real good, but he did stab one of the one of the hitters, right? I think he got hardwood in the hand, yeah. Through through the hand. Through the hand. But he screamed the way he screamed, bro, it was like an animal being executed. You know what I'm saying? It was it was like a scream that came from his gut. It was it was it was a it was a bad scream. And like I said, it was when he when it when he went silent. That's when he thought, well, they done killed the man. And uh, he didn't die. He didn't die. I guess they was hitting him with plexiglass pieces. I don't know. But, uh, yeah, they had to be hit. I don't know what they was hitting him with, but they worked on him for a good two minutes. And he tried to lay there and die. And then the dude Swift the oversaw the hit because he was like the sergeant of the arms for the ABT. He went to the dang door, opened the door, and then you see Brian laying in the floor all curled up and gasping for air. And Swift went in there and kind of woke him up a little bit, slapped him around, brought him back to consciousness, and like, man, you need to get up and get out of here. And he stumbled out onto the rail with a thousand stab wounds leaking everywhere and stumbled all the way down towards the stair area. Let me ask you then, this, right? When you were in Big Sandy, so did you? Do you think that was the most violent? I I do. I think it was the most violent prison at that time when we were there. That was the word. That was what they said. You know, I didn't know no other prison, bro. That's 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 the only USP I went to. I went from there to a medium, and uh, you were twenty one years old at the time when you seen all this. When you were jumped on, almost killed, seeing dudes getting stabbed, seeing people almost getting killed. Let me yeah. let, let, let me take you to the other unit now. Now you're in the other unit, right? You get moved. You're in there with coffee, and you know who Adam is, right? Yeah, Adam was cool. I was I was part of the independent car too, man, because we was independent dudes, just not letting the gangs do what the fuck they wanted to do to us, you know. <laughs> so, you were you there when Adam stabbed the cop? Yeah, I was in there. I think we all. I was the wine man, man. Um. I always found the wine spots. You remember I put the damn wine up above the bubble. We cut a hole in the laundry room. Then I was going behind the shower, cut the fire the fire extinguisher box. So me and Adam would make wine together, coordinate where we put our wine at and when we bringing our wine down. So do you remember when Adam stabbed that cop? Do you remember that night? Yeah, yeah. The hubcap. I don't remember his I don't remember his exact name, but we called him Hubcap because he always ran around fucking with people searching their cells, taking their wine, and he just had a, like, it was funny to him, you know what I'm saying? Preston went down there, and he tackled the kid Preston. I talk about Preston in the book. <laughs> I believe yeah. I talk about you in the book, right? And the, I believe, you know, the story about you makes the final cut yeah. in the book where, you know, you were went in the back of the shower. Remember when the pipes busted? You climbed back yeah. there and yeah. hot water. I, and then the, the spot was ruined. And then Steve was mad about the spot and all that bullshit. Yeah. But... You know, like I said, man, I know you've seen a lot of violence over there. You were just a kid, man. And they put you in a prison like Big Sandy with a 12-year sentence. Absolutely outrageous what the federal government does to kids, man. You were a kid. And they had you yeah. in this most dangerous, violent, maximum security prison in the United States. And you had a nonviolent like, crime. Like I told you the other day, bro, it was a curse and a blessing at the same time. Because uh, it showed me. There is a world within this. There is a world within this world. You know what I'm saying? It's a whole nother, another realm of activity that, that normal people wouldn't even think existed in our country, bro. And uh, it showed me I ain't never going back. I don't break laws. Um, I can't, it, What it did to me, let's say I might have deserved to go to prison. I'm pretty sure I did deserve to go to prison. But what it did to my family and my kids, bro, it, they didn't deserve it. They didn't deserve it. You know, you're the perfect dude to have on my show, and I'm going to tell you why. Because my mission is to save kids from life imprisonment and premature death, like your yeah. buddy Cedric Dean. We both know him. So the thing is this. You being a 20-year-old kid caught in a drug case, you go to federal prison, you see all this dangerous stuff. You know, you're the guy that I want to save. I want to stop you from going to prison. I want to stop okay. the Tonys just like you from going to prison, right? Yeah. So that's why it's perfect to have you on here. But I want to ask you another question. Were you there when Ace got shot from the tower? Yeah, I was. Let me say this. Cedric Dean 
why won't why we, since you brought that up, solid dude doing the same stuff you're doing. Help me get my GED. I was just joking with another guy the other day. Yeah, I got a Cedric Dean GED. That's what I call my GED. <laughs> so that dude, that dude taught me so much, man. We had our we had our differences and everything, but dude is a solid dude and taught me so much. He taught and what he taught. One thing he taught me, you said the other day, and I teach it to my son, the and my and my fourteen year old daughter. The image you project is the image you have to protect, and that's where I that's where I got that from. If you if you project the image of a bad guy or a knucklehead and you have to do things in order to keep that image. You just, I mean, it, it you know, that's a good dude, man. And, um, uh, I, I, I like to see y'all on this path doing right. But yeah. So Ace, yeah, I was familiar with Ace. I was friends with Ace and, um, I watched him get shot by the gun tower, man. I, I three dudes jumped on him and trying to get him gone. And I wasn't in, involved in inner politics of what was going on with it or nothing, but, they tried to jump on him to smash him off the line, and uh, he whipped out a steel, a, a, a piece of bunk metal, because we used to cut our knives out of the bunks, and started giving them the business, and didn't stop when the gun tower popped off. When the deuces hit, he didn't stop. They fired um, warning shots. I think they fired uh, the rubber bullets at him first, and he didn't stop. No, no, they didn't. They fired, what was it, the concussion grenade. At him first, and didn't, and, and he didn't stop, and he kept on stabbing the dude. And he was burying the knife in him. What was the dude's name? Stretch. 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 Yeah. So, you know, he didn't stop stabbing him. So they popped him with the AR, shot beside him, and then shot through him, and uh, he died. Do you remember? Uh, do you remember when he was laying on the ground and the nurse was trying to push his guts back into him, wiping yeah, the dirt well, off him? Well, I, I was a long way away. And so I, I seen fumbling around him. I thought they were just working on him, but yeah, man, I wasn't on the uh, track side when it happened. And then, you know, I don't, me personally, I don't really, you know, I didn't really care for Ace. You know what I mean? Yeah. Because yeah. you know what happened. He was me. cocky. He was cocky. Do you remember my situation when I left there? I do. I do. Um, I don't know why they, they wanted you gone or nothing. Cause I, I had went to the hole for something. And I remember you living with Adam. I remember we called you Chad. I really never had much interaction with you. You was kind of always doing your own thing. But we all, we well, like you would have been there for me because we were part of the independent car. I was there for you. I would have been there for you. I remember when we all strapped up and went out there to ride on the on the on the white games. And Jimmy taped all them dang uh books to it. He he had like fifteen books strapped to him with his jacket on in the summertime. And uh. I remember all that. So, yeah, so I was in the hole. And then I got transferred to the step-down unit. And they jumped on you on the basketball court side. I don't remember why, but I remember the black dudes. Cause in C1, half of the half of the unit you can see out on the on the basketball court, and half of the unit you can't. It just looks out over the mountains. And uh money. There's a story behind money too. Money was in there with me, a Boston cat, a black blood from Boston. And he was like, Yeah, your boy Coffee was out there getting rocked off on them three dudes, tried to jump on my boy Chad. I guess you might have known money or something. Yeah, I know and what money y'all, was. Y'all played ball or something together. And they like they were like, yeah, he, he they tried to jump on my boy Chad. He was out there giving him the business or whatever. So three dudes tried to jump you on the basketball court. And uh Coffee, my Sally, my good friend, was one of them. Another dude from North Carolina. And uh they tried to jump on you out there. And I guess you held your own and gave them the business because that's what money was telling. Like, yeah, he was piecing them dudes up out there and then coffee come back. I ended up catching up with coffee. He went to the hole. The hole was always overcrowded. So he came to see one for a week or two until I got transferred back to the yard. And I was riding him. I was like, man, y'all three dudes, y'all couldn't even handle that one dude. I was like, you know, giving them hell about it. You were making fun of them? Yeah. <laughs> just, I mean, man, yeah, I was them off. just like you, man. I was out there, man. I was fighting for my life. You know what I mean? And, yeah. you know, I, I could be faking and talking about, man, I wasn't scared. I was scared. That's why I kept fighting, but I was angry too. And when they shot, all them dudes hit the ground and I grabbed Ace while he was on the ground. I kept hitting them. And, you know, at that point, it's just kind of like, man, if they shoot me, they shoot me. I had 40 years, but that's neither here nor there, man. You know, it's just that. 
I wanted to take people inside this prison system because there's so many misconceptions about federal prison. These people think that federal prison is camp fed. You know, it's nice. We're living good. We're having a great time. And none of that stuff's true, man. We were in the most vicious, violent prison in the United States at that time. And it's still vicious there. And it's vicious in every single USP. But, you know, you know, we've been here a little while, so I want to give you an opportunity to tell your younger self, man, how you feel, man, or, or talk to the kids, man. Tell them, you know, you, you mentioned the image you project is the image you have to protect. And that's something that, you know, I always say. But if you had to talk to your younger self, what would you tell yourself, man, about a life of crime, about doing the wrong thing? You know, that's funny, man. I, I talk to my younger self every day. I got a 16-year-old son. And uh, he was on the wrong path when I came home from prison. And I talk to him every day and I teach him the things I learned the hard way. I try to teach him through my mistakes. And, and, I, and I keep it real with him. I, I talk to him about things you probably shouldn't talk with your children about or want your children to know about, but I keep it real with him. You know what I'm saying? Cause he suffered the most him and his sister and his sister and their mother suffered the most out of me going to prison. You know, don't That's nobody, real, give a, don't nobody give a damn about you when you're gone, except for your mama, your kids, you know, don't nobody care about you, bro. Don't they, they the ones that's going to suffer. They're the ones that's going to miss you on the holidays. They're the ones that's going to, my mama took it bad too, man. You know, she took it real bad too. And, um, you know, it, it, one thing I tell them, if you work hard when you're young, you can play hard when you're old. And you can, you, you're older for a lot longer than you're young. So, you know, just, it's not, it's not worth it. It's not worth it at all. Learn to love the small things in life. Cause that's where the gold's at. You know, the small things, the being, seeing, being able to see your family, look your family in the eye, watch your kids grow up. You know, money, money's not important. You know, everybody wants to glamorize money and cars and, and yeah, you got to have it to survive, but it's not what matters, man. You could be the poorest person, but still be the richest person. Rich in my eyes is not a financial standpoint. Rich is, does your family love you? Do your kids love you? Are, are, are your people taken care of? Are you there to support them in the time that they need to be supported? Are you here to guide your people in the right direction? You know, because when you're gone and you're behind that wall and you're watching all that crazy shit that we watched, you know, your people just out here in the wind, man. They don't have you. Whatever happens to them, happens to them. You know, if, if, I, if I wouldn't have came out and took control of my son, there's no telling where, where he, what path he would be on. At his age, I was committing armed robberies. Worst thing this kid does now, smoke a little bit of pot every now and then. And I, and I, bust, his, I, I, I bust his ass, not physically, but I'll put him on restriction, take his phone, take his game. And I try to keep him on the right path. But, you know, I do talk to myself, my younger self. <laughs> That's what's up. You know, it, it's, it's ironic how you say that you're talking to your younger self. It's your son. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we got to lead by example. Let me, let me say this, right? The things that we've seen were extremely violent. I think that that teaches you to appreciate your freedom and appreciate that you're no longer in that situation. And you've been home for a while now. Tell the people what you're doing. I mean, obviously you're being a father, which is commendable and the number one thing, man, because we have to be the leaders. And man, I struggle daily. I struggle daily, but I don't break no laws. Um, I came out. You're I working, right? Yeah, absolutely. I, so I came out and I got a job for $9 an hour. You know, I started a job at a bar for nine dollars an hour. I did a look, and I just worked my way up, bro. I, I I quit the job at the bar. I was getting in fights at the bar. I realized it wasn't a path for me. Quit the job at the bar. Started working at a moving company. Ended up driving straight trucks, and then like driving the trucks. So then I met a guy and started working for a building supply company. And I worked myself up from nine dollars an hour to a pretty a pretty decent annual salary, you know what I'm saying? And I, I own my own home, a couple cars, old pickup trucks, and I got a good girlfriend. I got full, my my son, he stays with me all the time. I had another baby, and she's six. I, my my 14-year-old daughter, me and her relationship's getting tighter. You know, I'm just, I get up and I go to work every day and I drive a tractor trailer delivering building supplies five days a week, and I come home and I might throw some pork chops on the grill cook for my family, help my little one with some schoolwork, 
chop it up with my son. Um, take my daughter. She likes to my my fourteen year old daughter. She just took her to get her nose pierced. She she worked me on that one. You know what I'm saying? But just the small things, bro. Being here, making sure that I'm gonna be here. That's what I do. That's what's up, man. I'm gonna close this chapter of Blood on the Razor Wire, telling everybody hit that subscribe button. We got real, raw content coming each and every show. We're out of here.